This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. Welcome to our show. I, I've often been informed that you can't really say on the radio, this person's like the greatest, the most fantastic, the, the nobody's better. We're going to do that today, okay? <laughs> now, now, before station management comes in and pulls me off the chair, uh, they'll probably agree with me because we have probably who you all hear is the voice of WCWP, but someone who's near and dear to me. This is Chris Maffei, who has engineered shows for me for many, many years and has helped me actually produce a documentary and, and lots of other great endeavors, including a, you know, a CD that we produced that was a museum interview over the years. And now he has a website that you should probably check out called multitrackminds.com because I've always relied upon him as my audio guru. And maybe you should think about, you know, him in that regard too. So welcome to the show that you've always been on the engineering side of things. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is, uh, it's very interesting to be on this side of things. I worked on this show for so long and it's really fun to now be one of your guests. So thank you for having me on. Well, it's about, it's about time. You know, people say like, the what, what time is it? It's about time. So let's talk. <laughs> so one of the things that has evolved, you know, Taking Care of Business is one of the longer running talk shows on WCWP. And in its early days, podcasting was really not really on the radar all those years ago. And now it's become almost too ubiquitous. Uh, let's talk about podcasting as an open platform, as a platform for thought, speech, expression, uh, copyright infringement, and everything else. Let's talk about that. Podcasting is uh, is a medium that is really near and dear to my heart, and it's a big part of why I think I got involved in radio in the first place. You know, I've always been a lover of audio and music and from, you know, as, as far back as I can remember, I always used to have a fascination with sound in general, music. And, you know, when I was a teenager, I started to really get into recording audio and wanting to produce my own audio and music, which eventually led me to the, the radio field. But what really got me in the door was my burgeoning love of podcasting, which was really just starting to be in its infancy around the time when I got into it. And I think the, the concept of podcasting and why I love it is that in its most basic form, it's just a digital audio file that someone recorded and they could have recorded it anywhere under any circumstances. And then it was distributed to you to listen to anywhere, no matter what you're doing under any circumstances, as long as you have the internet connection to download it you can listen to whatever that person created. And I think in its, in its most basic form, I think that lends itself really well to uh, the kind of intimate experience that I think a lot of people growing up with radio really treasured, but it takes it a step further because now you are literally hearing something that was potentially recorded in someone's home. You are hearing a group of friends sitting around a microphone talking about a movie they really enjoyed, or you're hearing someone tell their own personal story and that's why I love the independent open platform that is podcasting. But as you mentioned, it has, it has undergone some changes and it, it is becoming a bit more of a, of a big business, especially in recent years. There have been a lot of buyouts and acquisitions and there's just, there are so many aspects now to the podcast industry that it's hard to even know where to start really. But I think the thing that, that really draws me to it is, is just that ability to to get to know a host of a show as people have gotten to know you. Of course, your show is a radio show before it was a podcast, but, you know, it's been on the podcast platform. You were one of the, the early adopters at the station of podcasting, and you really jumped on that, so I, I commend you for that. But oh, it, 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 there's, there's really, there, there's so much that I love about podcasts that I feel um, it is the next mutation if you will, of radio. And uh, it is interesting to see that radio has started to 
now kind of encroach on, on podcasting territory. Well, let me ask you about the, the blurring of all the lines. You know, now to do things, it's almost like you have to be a media enterprise more than a podcast or a radio or whatever, because like, for example, this show, the show is podcasted. It goes on YouTube. It's streamcasted. It's on the, the WCWP app. It's, it's on all kinds of platforms. And to, to a large extent, I have to use video components because you can't ignore the, the, the importance and breadth of YouTube. Uh, and a lot of times the show is not really designed to see anything. I mean, we're talking and there's really nothing to see because uh, what, we're, what we're talking about is ephemeral. You can't really see, you know, it's not like we're showing a picture of like, like of, a, of a, an aircraft carrier, you know, or something like that, or, or a helicopter's landing, which is, or, or, or a golf putt, you know, at, at, at the finals. Uh, this is so different. So how do, you, how do you help your customers deal with those blurry lines of what's a podcast, what's a video cast, what do you need to do to be relevant in all the platforms, uh, short enough yet long enough, and all those other little dynamics that are so important to the creators of this, of this art? That's an interesting question because I find that the line does kind of get blurry in terms of what is a podcast that is purely an audio experience versus what can also be video content where you put up some cameras and or you, you record a Zoom call or something along those lines. And, you know, for me and my personal tastes and sensibilities, I will always lean towards podcasting is an audio first experience. And I, I, I really believe in that. And I, I, I know the value and, and I and I enjoy the 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 value of, of a great YouTube or video podcast or video interview and all the various video content that we see from independent creators these days. And I really do love that. But when I think of podcasting, I think of that as, I think that they're, they're almost like siblings in a way, but it's very different when you're talking about just a pure, purely a podcast experience, an audio experience. That is something that you don't need the visual component to. And if someone is, is telling their story in an audio form or you're having a discussion in an audio form, just as we are right now over the phone, you know, it, it, there doesn't need to necessarily be a visual component there always. And I think the temptation is to want to put your show on a visual platform, social media being a very visual platform as well as YouTube. So the one way that I like to kind of navigate around that, if, if you don't intend to have a video component recording your Zoom call, recording any kind of video call or putting up cameras while you're having your discussion, I like to produce what is called an audiogram, which just provides a little bit of a visual element. And what an audiogram essentially is, is it's, it could be any image, any background, any text. It can even have live captions, but the, the centerpiece of the audiogram is a visual waveform that adapts as the audio is played. And it is essentially what you record when you record an audio file. You see that visually through what is called a waveform. And what an audiogram does is it takes that and it makes it into a visually stimulating element that you can post a, a five-minute clip or a two-minute clip of your podcast on Instagram and have a waveform that goes along with it. So when people click on the video, they're not just staring at just a still image. And I think that it's, it's a very simple way to repurpose your audio content as video content. Now, that's not to say that it's as visually stimulating as watching someone as they speak, but in a lot of cases, it's just it's not totally necessary to have that visual component to your, your, your piece. And in lieu of putting up a one hour podcast on YouTube with a still image, which can be a little bit boring if someone is just sitting there looking at the screen. Well, if you have an audiogram, it's at least something to focus their eye on. And if it's something that you can focus your eye on, then you're going to pay attention a little bit closer as opposed to you just throw a podcast on and you have it on in the background. So I, I that is the one area I think where uh, an audio podcast can become video content 
not simply just as a slideshow or with a still image, but with something that adapts to the audio that, that you are hearing, but it's not the video component that you would traditionally see a YouTuber have or a television show or a movie. It's not something to completely focus on, but it is something to at least keep you engaged with the content, especially in short spurts, like on social media. Audiograms are really great for that, I feel. See, I don't do that. I guess that's something we should talk about because I'm, I'm actually learning, you know, that's, by the way, for the people out there, this is Chris Maffei, who's a phenomenal sound and audio engineer and uh, with an amazing amount of talent and insight. And he's always been sort of on the cutting edge of all of these platforms and, and technologies way before it became sort of mainstream. Uh, and one of the things that I kind of do is what is, the, I guess they call in the, the photography world, the kinestasis model, whereas I kind of just run the MP3 in uh, you know, a video editing program where I rotate a slide every three minutes and I kind of put something in because a lot of my content is truly what you're talking about, which is pure audio, people talking. Yeah. And it's almost like the kind of radio like where you close your eyes and you listen because the con it's all about the conversation. Um, and what I try to create, at least what I do, is to have the kind of conversation that's deep and thoughtful uh, between a few people, you know, two people, three people. I've had more than one host, you know, co-host. I've had multiple guests. I've had one, one time I had a, a, such a robust guest that we had four co-hosts <laughs> and one guest and we've had everything in between. But we always wanted it, at least from my perspective, that the people listening out there would almost want to just be like a fly in the wall, just kind of listening in vicariously and going, wow, if I could just yeah. kind of pull up a chair and join these people, you know, I could either learn more or contribute to what they're not talking about. And it would be really, really cool. You know, now I know there's all kinds of podcasts out there. A lot of them are how-tos. I know that how-to is very popular. And I know that a lot of people's consumption on YouTube is how to do things. Uh, you know, I, I, I have clients like in various kinds of professions who like, let's say plumbers, where they need to see how an installation works on a specific product, like a filter or this or that. And they'll go to the YouTube and they'll watch the video on how to install it. And I know that I've looked at YouTube's and evaluating uh, audio and technology products, for example. Um, oh, yeah. But those are more visual. Um, what, what do you coach people to do in their audio dynamics as far as sort of content and things like, uh, like uh, you know, and clicking and, you know, the annoying the finger tapping, ring tapping, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> that thing. Or maybe inappropriate laughter where you laugh. Maybe, maybe it should have been a little bit more serious. Uh, and I guess the old cough, because uh, we don't have cough buttons anymore. Remember a long time ago in yeah. radio stations, there was the cough button where you hit the thing and then you cough and then nobody would know. And now everything gets recorded. The, you know, the kids in yeah. the background, the cat, the barking dog. I mean, <laughs> Oh, yes. You know. Yeah, I guess now the equivalent to to the cough button would be muting yourself on Zoom, which is where a lot of audio content is <laughs> recorded these days. But 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 you know, it's funny. I I find Zoom, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but we're so over oversaturated with Zoom that it's kind of like watching perpetual Brady Bunch uh, screenshots. <laughs> and somehow, I guess I'm just more used to single shot camera angles where people are talking uh, as opposed to seeing all these people in little boxes uh, right. all talk. And, 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 and as you notice, over time on Zoom, people like have blank screens or uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share with the audience something kind of funny. Um, some children in another state were trying to avoid their Zoom school obligations. So they changed their screen names to reconnecting. <laughs> So the teachers would think that they lost the Wi-Fi connection and they were reconnecting. <laughs> so that is that is brilliant. So, so so by the way, don't do this at home. <laughs> and we did and we didn't tell you to do it. We're just reporting the news. But what what do you do to tell your clientele to be fresh, dynamic, 
how do you avoid the uh huh and this and that? I'm sure part of it is cleaning up audio, and I'm sure you do a great job because that's what you've done for me for years and years and years, where you've cleaned up all the hisses and hiccups and coughs and bizarre comments oh, yeah. by the host or the guests or things like that. <laughs> Did I say oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did I say that? I can't believe I said that. You know, that was you know, a bit, that was that, a that joke failed. <laughs> That's the that's the biggest thing is that as soon as you hear it committed to to tape, as it were, as soon as you hear the recorded file back, you now have a completely no holds barred insight into your own habits and vocal tics and weird sayings and phrases and bad habits. And that that in itself right there, there's there's no real coaching that needs to be done at that point. A lot of the time, a lot of the time, it'll just be, hey, you know, take a listen to this. There's, there's, you know, there are some behaviors here that we might want to try to curb and you never want to do that, you know, in, in any sort of, uh, you know, hard line stance of we cannot have any ums or coughs or vocal tics or, or mouth noises, because a lot of these things are uncontrollable for a lot of people, especially, especially, uh, unintentional noises and things like that, 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 just are, are a factor of just being alive and being human so a lot of the time that stuff just comes out in post and that you know that requires a very thorough cleaning a lot of the time especially if you have a guest on who's not used to talking in in this in the sort of forum of a podcast or a radio show a lot of the time that's just a lot of manual work in editing but for a host I always encourage them to listen back to themselves take notes and be aware of your own habits because that's really the first step to being able to say, replace a crutch word. Whereas you may say, um, you know, something like that, maybe just taking a little bit of a pause as you think about what you want to say, rather than saying, um, that can save a lot of time in editing and can make you sound a lot more prepared for the job that you're doing. So a lot of it is just listening back and just being aware and, and taking notes on yourself. And there are times where I do have to, you know, alert clients of, Hey, you know, maybe this isn't a great space to record. Maybe you need to not be moving around so much or use a different type of microphone, things like that. But those are all more, more technical things that can, that can be solved easily. Whereas habits and, and crutch words and things like that, those, those take a little bit, you know, they don't just come out in the wash. They, they take a little bit of time to, to work on. Well, we have to take our first break. You want to, you want to do the, you're listening to for me? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You're listening to Taking Care of Business on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business with my very special guest, Chris Maffei. And let me tell you, he is special because he's always been special to me. Uh, we've done a lot of work together in the audio world, and I would never have sounded as good as I do and have without all of that he's done, uh, really just coming in with the big broom and cleaning up the, <laughs> all of the things and, and uh, taking all those editing notes to heart, like remove bad joke at, you know, 2815, <laughs> 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 you know, or, or uh, you know, we had... We had people who cursed. We had to take the words out. They said all kinds of, all kinds of things that were not FCC compliant. We had to fix that. Um, and the funny thing was that the people who cursed the most were the people that should have known, you know, not to do it. It was never the people you, you <laughs> thought would be those people. It's always um, uh, anyway. That well, in fact, this is the kind of muttering and stumbling that Chris would fix. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll leave it in the show. You don't do this at home. Or this is what needs to be fixed to show a point. All right. So, yeah, this is all natural. Yes. Exactly. So there's all these podcast platforms out there. You know, I, I don't even know what the names of all of them are anymore because they keep changing. There's all these mergers and buyouts and things were called something and then they did away with it. And, yeah. you know, there was like in some of the big brands, I won't even mention them by name, but there was these people and then it was like – their, their music and then it became something else and then you get these notices that this is being discontinued and all, all the audio content is being shifted to some other thing how do you decide as a content provider 
what platforms to be on other than just all of them? You know, that's interesting. The only choice at this stage of the game is to be on all of them. And now the good news is that if you sign up for one podcast hosting service, whatever that may be, whether it's a free one or whether it's, it is a paid one, you will have the ability to distribute your RSS feed to all of the major platforms. And then you can also, as we mentioned, have a video component and put that on YouTube. But at this stage of the game where your competition is a podcast being produced by a company that was just bought out by one of the major radio chains in this country or a podcast being produced by Spotify or Netflix, which already have a built-in audience that they can then promote to on their platforms, you really do need to be everywhere in order to be heard because you're, it, it, you know, it would kind of be like if we started a TV network and our only outlet was public access. You know, if you're only on one platform, maybe a smaller platform, or maybe, maybe you're not on the Apple charts or maybe you're not on Spotify or, or Google Podcasts, then you are maybe getting a few listens, a few downloads, but your discoverability isn't anywhere near what it needs to be. So the solution for the podcaster in, in today's market is get on every platform that you can, submit your feed to every platform that you can, and then just an all-out assault on social media and any communities and anything like Reddit or communities, online fan communities relevant to anything that you may be talking about Think, things that already have a built-in fan base, it's a little bit easier to get your podcast in, in front of. But if you're starting something very niche or you're starting something that maybe maybe is uncharted and, and has never been done before, you know, it sometimes it could be the luck of the algorithm. You know, it, it can really be that you get lucky and, and someone happens to mention you on social media in a, in a post that a lot of people see. Or it may just be that the algorithm is such that you come up as a suggestion you know, in someone's podcast feed on, on Spotify or whatever the case might be. There is no concrete answer to, you know, questions like these because it keeps changing. As you said, the landscape keeps shifting as companies like Spotify become more ubiquitous in the podcasting industry and, and wanting to kind of stake their claim and their, their claim being that we are the YouTube of audio as they've put it in the past, and you see major radio chains starting to get in on the game and buying up all of these independent and boutique podcast production companies and bringing them in under one fold, it starts to become a little bit like, okay, now it's like starting to trying to start a pirate radio station versus starting a podcast in the sense that it's an open platform, but it is not an even playing field. And you are competing with the heavy hitters now. So if you're producing your own content independently just as a labor of love or if you're trying to start a brand and grow that brand via the medium, you know, these are the realities that you're facing at, at this stage. So if you're a listener, we, we kind of talked about podcasting from the platform side, but let's now talk about you're the, you're the consumer. You're the, you're the guy in the Max L commercial in the big chair, <laughs> the wind <laughs> flying backwards as the chair moves back and the guy goes, gets the drink as it's moving towards him. How do people decide which podcast platforms to listen to? Because at some point, if you're on any pla if you're on every platform, then it doesn't really matter who you pick as a platform because, uh, everything's on it. Uh, and the other question sort of that's related is a long time ago, radio was like the gatekeeper of music. Maybe whether that was good or bad, that, that remains to be decided. But at least there wasn't like 7 billion bands. Um, imagine like a buffet of, of every food in the world in a gigantic warehouse. And they say, go eat. And you don't know where to start, you know, and you can only eat so, and you can only eat so much. And that's kind of what like podcasting is. It's like, it's like there's 7 million dishes of food I can eat at this buffet and I can only eat maybe three plates. <laughs> and then I'm going to be really full and tired. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so how do we do that? How, do you, how does the consumer pick both the forum and, and what to consume when, when there's so much choice? 
And it's an impossibility to really explore everything, even just to figure exactly. out what, what to narrow it down from. Yeah, you know, I don't think we've ever been as inundated with content as we are currently, you, you know, with streaming services and TV and movies and all of that kind of melding into streaming. And then you have access to the largest music library in the world through music streaming services. And then there's podcasts and where does that all fit into it? And I think that is, that is part of why a lot of people are slower to get into podcasts because Number one, I don't think they understand what they are at first. And then when they do understand, they might say, well, why do I want that? I have so much other content that I'm consuming. But I think, and this for me personally, this is how I got into podcasts. I think podcasts are great as a companion to something that you're already interested in. Let's say, you know, let's take something like you watch a TV show and you want to hear people just talk about that show and talk about their theories and talk about their favorite moments and behind the scenes information. And you want to learn more. You want to kind of uh, you want to delve into a specific topic. Then you'll look for podcasts like that. You know, you just type it into the search bar of whatever podcast app you use. A lot of people use the Apple podcast app. But Google also has one. Spotify is a very popular one now because people are already on that platform for their music. So they've started to listen to podcasts on Spotify as well. And then there are third-party podcast apps. Like I use one called Pocket Cast, which I, you know, I, I have been using for years and years and years. And that's just because of the fact that early on, if you weren't using an Apple device, then you didn't have access to the Apple Podcast app. You had to seek third-party options. Spotify and Google were not they were a little bit late to the game in terms of podcasting, you know, on any sort of larger scale. So what you would do is you just type in keywords, things that you're interested in, things you'd like to learn about, things you're curious about into the search bar. Another great way to do it is just to look on social media. If you're looking for a podcast about something specific, then a lot of times if you just search for that, you know, the subject with the word podcast in the search bar on, let's say, Twitter, you might find that there's a podcast out there and they're promoting themselves. And then you'll probably find a link to where you can subscribe, you know, right on their page. And it's, it's really just in terms of the, the endless buffet of content that we have available to us now, I would say you just kind of have to go with what you're interested in, I think, at any given moment. And that, that's not just for podcasting. I think that's just for, you know, all across the board. We are inundated with content, as I said, and, you know, if you try to consume everything that you see that that looks good, then you know you're not gonna you're you're not gonna feel good after after a day of of just endless binging and just spending all of your free time in front of a screen or listening to something. So, I think the most important thing is you know moderation. If you find ten podcasts about one particular subject, or you find ten podcasts that you're interested in, you don't need to necessarily listen to all of them at the same time. You can subscribe and listen to them later. You can pick the ones that you're most interested in. Let's say one is the perfect duration for your commute. Well, that's the one you start with. Or let's say you're going to be cleaning the house and you want to have something on in the background to listen to. This one looks like it would be a good, a good choice. That type of thing. I think you, you, you start small like anything. You start small, you dip your toe in the water, and eventually it'll grow. Like I started out listening to one, two, maybe three podcasts for my first year or so when I was listening to podcasts over a decade ago when I first got into it. And now I don't even want to tell you how many I'm subscribed to at this point because it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a medium that I, I really do find has uh, enhanced a lot of my areas of enjoyment over the years. And, you know, I feel that there's, there's a really strong is a really strong uh, connection in your brain that happens when, when you, you're listening to someone talking about either something that you already enjoy and, and they're, they're shedding some new light and, and providing a different perspective on it that you've never heard before and never thought of, or you're learning something new for the first time from, from a familiar voice that you've learned to trust and know. So I, I think that that's something really important that podcasting has, has brought to me over the years. And, I, I think it's just a matter of finding whose voice works for you, whose style. Every podcaster has a different cadence, a different style. Every show has a little bit of a different format. 
And it's really just about finding what you kind of vibe with and what is kind of your wavelength. One of the things that I like about YouTube is sort of the feedback. You know, um, when you're a streaming service, like, like, like our podcast, Taking Care of Business, you know, it's just out there. And people listen, and I, I see all the statistics. But there are times when I get, you know, comments on YouTube like, wow, I saw Brother Mustard 15 years ago and just came across this interview. And, you know, do they have any new stuff or any live stuff or anything's unreleased? And I was able to connect that person with the band. So, it, you know, and they actually did have some stuff and whatever. And it was a great story. Um, and you get feedback or people who've made comments about, oh, this show really helped me or, you know, gave like a how-to thing on something. Um, and people wrote very nice things. And I've always thought as a podcaster, broadcaster, that was really the best part of the job is, is getting that kind of feedback. You don't really get that in straight streaming. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the beauties of the platform of YouTube is the immediacy that you're, you're able to interact with that, that content with, you know, the immediacy that you can just type in a comment and you can maybe get a reply and have some sort of a conversation or other, other people who are watching that YouTube video can, can respond. And suddenly you're interacting about, you know, a shared interest or, or a common experience. And that is one of the beauties of YouTube that, I, that's why I do feel it is valuable for podcasts to have a presence on YouTube. But just strictly from an, an audio standpoint, we do not yet have the capability within the major podcast apps to leave comments on episodes. And whether or not that's something that they will ever open it up to, I'm, I'm not sure. Because as we do see a lot of times, YouTube comment sections can become very toxic very quickly and, and they can kind of devolve from there. So I think the way that a lot of podcasters like to do it is through social media. And if you're listening to a podcast and you have a thought about it, you know, you send them a tweet or a message on Instagram or on Facebook, whatever your preferred platform is. If that podcast has a presence there, then you can have that discussion. And I think that's, that's one of the coolest aspects is that a lot of podcasts do build their own little communities of listeners. And then listeners, they get to know each other just through interacting about the podcast and friendships can happen from that. I, I've made a few friends just from podcasts that I listen to, and I have other friends who have gone on to strike up friendships because of podcasts that they listen to, just, you know, common interests and, and shared experiences and things like that. So I think that that's kind of the workaround for, yeah, it's a lack of immediacy when you're just listening. And especially if you're doing something else, let's say you're in the car and you're listening to a podcast and you really have a thought that you want to get out you can't do that while you're driving, obviously, or you definitely shouldn't. But, you know, maybe, maybe when you get to wherever you're going, maybe you pop on to Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media outlet and you get in touch with those people and, and you leave the comments. So it, it takes a little bit of an extra step and sometimes you have to remind yourself to do it. But that is, I think, the way that podcasts can build communities. And, of course, there are things like reviews you can leave for podcasts, but that's a little bit more of a of a one way and that's not, that's not an interactive thing. So I think especially a lot of podcasts like to like to make Reddit subreddits, Reddit communities, which is a really cool way to build a community online. And it's a, it's a central hub. It's a place to go for people who want to talk about the content that you're putting out and have discussions that can kind of evolve from there. So, when you have shows up there, like uh, on like taking care of business, I'm kind of amazed that some shows have just unbelievable traction, and then there are other shows that you would think should have some traction, and it has almost none. And yeah. I can't necessarily reconcile why. While this one has ten thousand hits, and this one has like four, you know. <laughs> You know, and it's, yeah. it's, it's just very odd. And I, I've never been able to figure out what it is other than that it's either not <laughs> discovered or it just didn't resonate with the right people or it didn't connect. But I always right. found it interesting that you can never really predict what will actually be successful and take, yeah. take, on, some, take on some wings, you know? Yeah, you, can, you, you really can never 
uh, accurately predict what will get the kind of traction that, that you would hope or, or would want it to get. And sometimes it just comes down to search engine optimization. And that, and that gets into a lot of marketing mumbo jumbo. But, you know, you have the right keywords or sometimes if you have the right person plugging your content on the Internet, sometimes all, all, sometimes all it takes is one link from the right person at the right time to all of a sudden you see a spike in downloads or views. So sometimes it's just luck. It's the luck of the draw sometimes. All right, so we're about to take a break, but I'm going to ask you a question to, th to ponder during the break. And the, break the, the, the question is this. You and I, are take a, we have a time capsule. We're going to take this episode of the, this show. We're going to put it in a time capsule, and somehow we're going to put it like maybe in the dirt by WCWP and say, open in 50 years. So it'll be 2071. So they open up. First of all, will they have the ability to actually listen to it? Because <laughs> that you know, every you know, first it was the cassette, you know, eight track cassette, vinyl, USB, and then all this uh, cloud. So who knows? But let's assume that they could listen to it. What will they actually think about? What we're talking about is this going to be like the the World War World War Two style walkie talkie that eventually became the flip phone, and they're going to be like, what are they talking about? Anyway, we're, we're, we'll pick that up right on the other side of the break. Rich Solomon, Chris Maffei of MultitrackMinds.com. Don't leave us. Welcome back. Richard Solomon taking care of business with my friend and, more importantly, a, a real colleague in the truest sense. And that's Chris Maffei of MultitrackMinds.com. I cannot say enough great things about his incredible talent, his incredible abilities in a broad spectrum of audio, video, and other endeavors. He was always way above the curve. And the coolest thing is you'd see him in his office at WCWP masterminding all this like cool stuff. And you, you could see that the concentration, you know, and all the things going on. And then, when you see the final product, you're like, wow, I didn't think I sounded even half as good <laughs> as you, you clean that up. Wow. You know, so, so multitrackminds.com, Chris Maffei, and uh, not only that, but extraordinarily, extraordinarily talented and an oh, important I part. I, I, I appreciate the kind words. No, thank you. I, I, I really do. And, and I will say this, you know, it's, it's, there's a, a saying that we like to say in audio, it's garbage in garbage out. So, there's there's never there's never anything that uh, that you've done that that I've had to say. Ooh, no, we can't uh, we can't do anything with that. You've always uh, provided me with a lot of great content over the years to work with. So well, that's, I appreciate that. That's why we ranked 12 million on the YouTube charts. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we can get up to 10 million. <laughs> you know, you know, and I say that jokingly because in many ways it's so hard with all of those podcasts out there to have any recognition. Now, as we speak, I think I'm hovering around, I don't know, like 113,000 hits on YouTube, which in many ways is, is extraordinarily, you know, amazing to think about uh, where we're not commercial. We don't push anything. We don't sell anything. We're not sponsored by anybody. We don't pay for links. We don't do any of that stuff. So it's, it's kind of cool, but you know, you look at some of the things that are out there and, and it's, you know, there's, you know, 100 million views and you're like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's even and like... And then you see their marketing budget. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, or you see, you, see, you, you know, and there's, there's truly some incredible stuff. Uh, I've seen some incredible documentaries and you look at all of the production and editing and time and content that went into it um, and that it's essentially free to the user um, and it's kind of amazing because it's like, wow, uh, somebody really spent a true labor of love. Look, look at the show that we did uh, with the Beatles on the BBC. Um, you did an extraordinarily amazing effort in editing the music and, and just the, the, the way he did this beginning, which was like listening to the dial, the old fashioned dial when you had to use your hand to tune and it was like you know you're getting into the, the the little static of the stations and then you catch like a Beatles song on one channel and then you'd surf into another channel um, but now everything's digital so people don't really know um, I, I, I could probably recreate that um, 
that kind of sound. Let me see here. I have, a, I have an old transistor radio, and it'd be, let's see what we got. Wait. Like, like this kind of noise. <laughs> People don't get that anymore because everything's just spot onto a digital thing. But Chris did this great stuff. And we did this thing with Star Trek where um, it was the Star Trek 50 episode. And Chris did this amazing intro where we did, you know, Space the Final Frontier. And he, he used the music by Alexander Courage, uh, the theme from Star Trek, and just did this whole really neat in, in, uh, you know, intro. I, I thought it was superb. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And when I, Every time I hear it, I always think of how Chris put it together. I'm like, wow, that was an amazing job. And his timing was impeccable because when we did it, I just talked it. Um, and somehow Chris said, hey, I got a great idea. And he did this intro, and it worked perfectly. So, you know, just a you know, multitrackminds.com is all I have to say. So, <laughs> so anyway, so I'm, I got my shovel. I'm digging, and it's 2071, and my back hurts. <laughs> and I pull out, I guess, a, a gold <laughs> CD that has a 100-year lifespan on it. And then uh, people look at this thing, and they're like, what are they talking about? What are those guys talking about? <laughs> You know, I think the first thing that they might say is, "Oh, it's so long." <laughs> so what are what are what is your you know you got the crystal ball going and uh, we're extrapolating and we're looking at the trend. What do you see podcasting looking looking like in the in the way horizon future? Well, I can already see the next mutation of things, or at least the next companion to podcasting coming in the form of real-time live audio chat from apps like Clubhouse, uh, which, which kind of popped up and added their own little wrinkle to the audio spectrum, which now every social media platform and website is trying to come up with their own version of. But real-time audio chat and micro-podcasting and shorter-form content and all of that, I feel at some point, is, is going to have its own next mutation of whatever this is. It's all just audio at the end of the day, from radio to podcasting to whatever the next thing is, because I do believe that there will be something after podcasting that is not called podcasting. I think the term podcast, which really stems from, when you think about it, the iPod, which is obsolete hardware at this point, there, there will be something to come along and replace it, and there will be a fancy new term for it, and there will be there will be all sorts of new platforms and new, new content being created. I think the thing that they would say now is, wow, look at these, these two guys pontificating about all of these things that, uh, that are now completely <laughs> irrelevant because of, all the new, uh, because of all the new platforms and things out there. But a lot of it still will, will hold over. I think the, the core basics of recording good audio and having good content and being interesting and being prepared for what you do, but also not overproducing, not overdoing it, leaving, letting it be a little bit natural, letting it breathe a little bit. I think those are all really important factors to consider whenever you're producing anything, audio content, video content, what have you. I think the thing that, as I said, that most of all, I think they'll say, wow, this is really long, because if we talk for... 54 minutes here and we have this long conversation just think of you know with short attention spans being what they are now just think of how short the average content will be you know decades into the future just think of of the the experience of of consuming content long form content may be very different to what we know it to today whereas i could sit down and enjoy every second of a two-hour documentary or even a two-hour podcast on the right subject I don't know if that'll necessarily be feasible, you know, in decades going forward, especially just with the increasing amount of options for your eyes and ears. I think it's going to become a lot more attractive to produce shorter content that is more easily consumable so people can move on to the next thing as they move about their day. Well, There's it, also the... It, it's, you know, I don't want to, you, yeah, interesting enough, um, my friend Yitzhak Sofles, who is the... Uh, president of Bottom Line Marketing Group and the host and producer of Mind Your Business um, on one of the commercial AM stations. Uh, even though he has the one-hour business show, he has these one-minute clips that he has on Instagram called Business Class. And literally, it's one minute where a person of 
business, you know, experience, will give one tip about, you know, something out there. And he posts them all over the place. He has a lot of these clips out there. And they're just one minute pearls of wisdom. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's actually happening now. That's concurrent, you know. When, 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 Absolutely. So when they dig up our USB or CD 50 years from now, what's the attention span going to be like, you know? I mean, yeah, you'd, you'd have to wonder. It, even sometimes I, I feel that a 10-minute video on YouTube, a tutorial, sometimes I see people in the comments saying this could have been two minutes. You know, you get down to boil it down to the very essentials. If you just extract what you need to know so you can quickly move on to the next thing. And I think sometimes there is something to be said for brevity, but I also do enjoy long-form conversations and long-form content, and I would hate to see that go away entirely. But I think ultimately the platforms will decide, the type of platforms that we have will really decide, you know, which is more conducive, whether it be long-form content or short-form. And I, I think it, it, you know, it, it tends to weigh more on the side of, shorter form content that's more easily digestible. But, you know, we, we do see a lot of video content now, especially on, on YouTube. We see a lot more a push for shorter content, shorter content that can be easily viewed on a cell phone in a, in a vertical format, which is, you know, completely different to how we've interacted with most video content, you know, over the, the, the past few decades. So it's, it, everything kind of takes a new... Uh, a new a new shape, a new trend, and every few years somebody thinks that they're going to completely reinvent the experience of of entertainment and the way that we interact with these things. And sometimes it's just a matter of you know seeing what sticks and with a, with some hindsight and you know with some with some certainly the 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 knowledge that they will have in in the future if they're listening to this in the uh, WCWP time capsule if they even have a way to play this audio file. Uh, which should be a thing. We should get Dan to do a time capsule. That would be pretty fun. We're gonna, we're, if they had a way to even play this file, it would be very interesting. Uh, if if that if that you know if they even did have a way to to play it, if digital audio files are are somehow you know you can't you can't play them anymore. If computers have completely been made obsolete by some new form of of technology, you know I I guess the possibilities are endless when you're dealing with something like tape. If something's not well maintained, well, you know, it can degrade over time and, and then be rendered useless. And the same can be said for, for digital files and digital uh, storage formats. So I guess it'd be interesting to see, yeah, what does, what does make the cut by that, by that time? Well, interestingly enough, I do have a few leftover 8-track tapes. And a, <laughs> I had a client who was a musician, and he was young. He was like, I don't know, 19 years old. And, and I said to him, I'm going to blow your mind. And I said, close your eyes. And I, and, I, and I just put it in his hands and I said, don't open your eyes. What is this? He goes, I have, he goes, I don't, what is this? And he opened up, I go, this is an eight track tape. This is the great grandfather of the USB stick. Um, it, and and you can't even, it can't even play it on any, anything anymore. But when you played it, you know, they used to be in cars and the funny thing is, in the middle of the song, it would go click, <laughs> and, and it would switch. Like you'd be listening to like a song, like I don't know, something like like Fleetwood Mac. It'd be like you could go your own way, go your own way, click, go your way, <laughs> like that kind of thing. And like the song was interrupted, there was hisses. Um, you know, the the tape would somehow be destroyed from heat or stretching. Um, I, you know, I remember my brother and I would be in the office and we would listen to eight track tapes just for fun, you know, and then he'd say like, um, we've suffered another eight track death today because <laughs> <laughs> they just wouldn't last, you know, uh, they really weren't, oh, yeah. made, they weren't made to hold up just like, you know, old videos. I, I, I remember looking at old family videos on VHS and, and you're like, oh my God, like it's, it's faded, but you could barely see it. Um, you know, all of it's degraded in terms of, you know, visual and sometimes the sound is all shot. So I hear what you're saying, you know, when it comes oh, to yeah. I, all that this. Can, that can trigger those, those memories that you're having there, that, that can trigger a lot of nostalgia for, for people these days. And as weird as it sounds, 
cassettes are even becoming a little bit more of a, of a trendy thing these days, especially with younger people, because it's about the aesthetic. They think it's cool. It's lo-fi. It's, it's, you know, it's a very inconvenient technology these days, but it has its own particular character. And you can say what you want about the sound quality of cassettes. And yeah, sure, they're, they're not what vinyl is, whereas vinyl is, vinyl is a bit of a, a warmer and, and more organic experience. Cassettes are, you know, they're, they air more on the, the, the lo-fi side of things, and they're, it's not a pristine listening experience. But for someone like me who, who grew up listening to cassettes, even before I got CDs, I do have a huge nostalgia factor for cassettes. So perhaps one day there will be someone who has, has nostalgia for USB drives and digital files <laughs> that same way. Well, you know, it's interesting about cassettes. That's really where the first playlists were kind of invented because, you know, vinyl was vinyl and compact disc is compact disc, but you were able to engineer your own music experience on a cassette that you know you couldn't really do that in any other uh, in any other format and that that's right. really that was the really the precursor to the spotify's and the pandoras and all the other stuff was really the cassette tape you know absolutely yeah yeah so, oh yeah and and people used to make music that way too people would record their own music at home which is and that's completely now been transformed just in terms of what you can do you know with within just within my computer alone right now i have more processing power and, and firepower and capabilities than, you know, a multi-million dollar studio in, in the 1980s or even the 1990s, you know, that's not to say that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of technical talent and personnel and all the things that came along with that experience back then. So it's, it's, a, it's very different, but just in terms of the sheer technical ability now, you know, we can do so much. An album can be produced right here in my room a movie can be produced, you know, it, with someone in their backyard shooting on their iPhone. We can do so much with, with all of this technology that we have. But a lot of times there are still barriers in terms of people's technical abilities or their, even their patience to kind of get it all done, which is, you know, that, that's, it's still the, the barriers to entry are, are, have never been lower if you want to create content. But there's still a lot of, you know, you need to go about it the right way and you do need to you know, have some solid fundamentals with whatever you're, you're, you're creating. And the good news is that there's probably someone out there creating YouTube tutorials on just that thing. So <laughs> if you need to learn how to do anything, you can probably just go find it on YouTube, which is one of the, one of the great things about living in the age that we do. But if you actually want to learn the real gestichte, that's an audio term, <laughs> the real gestichte on audio, uh, contact Chris at multitrackminds.com because I, I've learned a lot from him about energy, about copy, uh, about brevity, about timing, uh, mixing it up. Uh, I mean, there's just so many things, you know, when we sit, you know, you know, <laughs> you know. Uh, there it is. There it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, that we did together and still do. And that's the thing. People, you don't just get in front of a microphone and you hit on and then you hit save and it's over. You know, for serious podcasting, if you're going to do it right, you got to really, you know, understand a lot of the dynamics. And Chris is the person who can help in those dynamics as he's done uh, for so many other people out there. Sadly, uh, we're in our last minute. So... I can't thank you enough for all that you've done with me and continue to do. I'm so pleased that you're able to spend some time with me. And uh, you have to come back because we didn't even like scratch the surface. Speaking oh, of, yeah, that's, speaking that's, of tape. That's very, true. <laughs> very true. As as all of our conversations, I feel like they're, they all end with a to be continued. So I appreciate you having me on. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. All right. So for those out there listening, thank you. For those out there on YouTube listen, listening, thank you too. And we'll see you next time.